I just read a shocking new study that says up to 936 million people worldwide have sleep apnea. You heard that right, almost a billion people. That's literally 10 times the number we once thought. So in this video, I wanna walk you through what sleep apnea actually is and how to tell if you might have it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor. Now, with sleep apnea, there's still a lot of misinformation out there, and many people don't even know what sleep apnea is or how it could be affecting them. So first off, what exactly is sleep apnea? Well, it turns out sleep apnea is when there's either a partial or complete stoppage of breath while you're asleep. That's right, you have sleep apnea where you actually stop breathing for a few moments. I know that sounds pretty scary, and that's why we're here to take sleep apnea seriously, and we wanna get you treated sooner rather than later. But why you stop breathing during sleep comes down to whether you have obstructive sleep apnea or something called central sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea is a neurological issue where your brain actually tells your lungs, don't breathe. This is very challenging issue to treat, but thankfully it's not as common as obstructive sleep apnea or what we call OSA. OSA happens to be when there is an obstruction of some kind that actually causes you to stop breathing. So maybe it's big tonsils, large adenoids. There's a whole host of physical or anatomical things that could be going on in the throat versus a neurologic thing where your brain is telling your lungs don't breathe. But for it to be officially treated as apnea, you have to have a cessation of breath, which means stopping breathing for at least 10 seconds, followed by an awakening, and you might not even remember this. By the way, when I'm looking at sleep studies, sometimes it's longer than 10 seconds. I've actually seen somebody have sleep apnea for 60 seconds, 70 seconds, and, and sometimes we run in there to make sure that they're okay. Typically, these apneas occur because of a blockage caused by collapsed tissue found in the throat or in the upper part of the palate or the mouth. This can happen when muscles relax while you're sleeping, and it's actually the same mechanism that is used when snoring, it just goes a bit further. There's actually a pretty close connection between snoring and sleep apnea. As you fall asleep and those tissues collapse onto the airway, they make the airway smaller. The effect is similar to putting your finger over the end of a garden hose. All of that comes out faster, which means air moves faster. Uh, and so what happens is all that air is condensed into a smaller space, which makes it move faster. And now it's moving fast enough to vibrate those tissues and make that classic snoring noise. Let me pause for a moment and make it clear that not everyone who snores has sleep apnea but it is common symptoms for upwards of 90% of people who do in fact have sleep apnea. All right, what are some other symptoms since snoring might not be the easiest way to figure this out? A lot of people think of sleep apnea as a big person's issue. As a matter of fact, you don't necessarily have to be overweight to experience disordered breathing. However, being heavier does oftentimes go hand in hand with sleep apnea, so it's certainly something to keep in mind. What else? Well, people with sleep apnea are often tired during the day because their body is waking them up sometimes hundreds of times during the night. They might also wake up in the morning with a dry mouth, headaches from heavy mouth breathing. They may have restless sleep at night, night sweats. They may get up to go to the bathroom a few times or wake up in the morning in a bad mood, depression, anxiety, things like that. All are things that trigger me to think maybe this person has sleep apnea. Now, normally, this is the part of the video where the host stops and says, hey, do me a favor, like and subscribe. I'm not gonna do that because instead, what I care about more is that you share this video. Think of someone you know who could have sleep apnea, may not know it, or even is just a heavy snorer. Send them this video. It's really important to me that we spread the word about this condition because like I said, almost a billion people out there have it and most people have no idea. They're leading these depressed, sleepless, miserable nights and we can help them. There is there, This is a treatable situation. So what are the causes of sleep apnea? Well, we've mentioned a few, but let's break them down. Age, as we get older, we have a far greater likelihood of having sleep apnea. In fact, when you look at the ratio of men to women, it used to be before age 50, men two times as likely to have sleep apnea as women. That changes as soon as women go through menopause and it becomes a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, why might that be? Well, one of the things we know is there's an increase in weight and hormonal fluctuations. We also know, and I think I've kind of beat this one up, anatomical features, right? So large tonsils, large adenoids, getting strep throat on a regular basis. Anything anatomically in here can definitely have a factor. 
And then of course, substance abuse. We see a lot of people who use alcohol regularly to help them fall asleep. This just makes the situation significantly, significantly worse. So that's another thing that we're definitely looking for. Now, of course, there's things like nasal obstruction, right? So things like rhinitis, polyps, which are these kind of tissue, big pieces of tissue that kind of get up, jammed up in there. Deviated septum, that's the piece of cartilage in the middle is kind of wonky and goes all over the place. Something called hypertrophy of tonsils and adenoids, so a swelling. Also hypertrophy of your soft palate and your uvula, which is that, you know, that piece of flesh that's kind of hanging down in the back of your throat that nobody really knows why it's there. Also, believe it or not, facial malformation. So we've got things like people who have certain disorders in terms of acromegalia, things of that nature can, can cause sleep apnea. And and something called micrognathia. So that has to do with where's your chin. So you notice my chin is slightly in front of my lips. Well, some people have retrognathia, which means their chin is behind their lips. And some people have it in front. If you have it behind, that means all of that anatomy is displaced backwards. And guess what? There's a very high likelihood that you're gonna have sleep apnea. Now, of course, we can't go by gut feeling alone. So that's when a sleep study comes in very handy. There are different types of sleep studies. Some of them are done in a laboratory where you come in and sleep for the night. They attach about 27 electrodes to your body and you're monitored while you sleep. To be honest, this can be a pretty invasive and not particularly comfortable. Thankfully, there are plenty of in-home testing services now that are pretty good at detecting sleep apnea just by having you wear several small sensors. A lot of them have something that you can put on your wrist and then it measures oxygen here. Maybe there's even a sensor for your chest with snoring, but it's not the 27 electrodes that we have in the lab. After you're done with that for a few nights, you send it back to the lab and they send you a report with a score on it. Based on that score, we can tell if you have sleep apnea or not because it's kept track of all the times that you've stopped breathing throughout the night. The cutoff for diagnosis is if you stop breathing five or more times per hour as you sleep. So a mild diagnosis is gonna be between five and 15 times an hour. Between 15 to 30 times an hour, believe it or not, is only moderate, and 30 and above is severe. Okay, maybe I've convinced you that getting treated for sleep apnea is important, but you think, oh, geez, doc, what are they gonna to do to me? How are they gonna fix this? Is it a pill? Is it surgery? To be fair, the number one intervention for sleep apnea at this point is something called a CPAP machine, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And to be honest, it's something that may take a little getting used to. Think of a vacuum cleaner in reverse that gently blows a stream of air uh, to help you keep your airway all night. So basically what it does is it kind of goes up into your nose, and then when it hits that obstruction, it just ever so slightly opens it up and then sends air straight to your lungs. And believe it or not, you sleep through this whole process. This kind of treatment works 98% of the time. So it's incredibly effective. There are a few side effects. You gotta get used to wearing a mask on your nose. It's not the most fun or sexy thing to wear at the night. And the mask that sits on your face and compressor that sits by your bed may make you feel like you're in a little bit of a hospital room. I tried one just so I could understand what it was like for my patients. And to be fair, it took me three weeks uh, to get used to sleeping with one on, that being the mask and then actually air blowing. So if you're newly diagnosed, don't get discouraged because quite frankly, it takes a little bit of time to get used to the CPAP machine. There are some other options out there and I know a lot of people are saying, there's no way I'm gonna be able to wear a mask like that. That's okay, I get it. Uh, there are other options. There are oral appliances. These are specialized dental guards. They go over your upper and your lower teeth and they gently move your jaw forward, just a few millimeters, popping open your airway just a bit. That gives you more space in the back of your mouth and throat so the air can move more freely through there without being obstructed by tissue. These appliances still take a little getting used to, but by and large, a dental appliance is much easier than a CPAP mask. But to be fair, in some cases, it might not be nearly as effective. I wanna be clear, there are some cases where a mouth guard is equally as effective and probably better tolerated than a CPAP. Now, I'm gonna talk about surgery. I'm mentioning this because maybe some of you have heard about it. I have to say, I'm not a huge fan. If it isn't done right, the procedure itself can feel quite barbaric and is often tissue that removed grows back. So I kind of call it the roto-rooter of the back of the mouth, but what they do is they carve out all of that tissue and it's a super vascular area. So this area requires a lot of healing, a lot of attention, it's not fun. But once you get all that out, it does have a tendency to work. The big problem is 50% of the time the tissue grows back. So I usually advocate for one of the other treatment methods that I've already mentioned. Um, and, and I don't wanna forget the, the importance of lifestyle changes, right? So simple things like diet, exercise can actually make a huge difference. Stopping smoking, cutting back on alcohol consumption, especially before bed can slow this down. Now, if you've listened to this video and you think you might have sleep apnea, 
I'd actually suggest taking a home sleep test. They're really convenient. You can get your results fast. And since COVID, the price of them has dropped a ton. I've got some links below to one of my favorite home sleep tests that you can check out. Seriously, it's better to rule out if you have sleep apnea or not. Your health depends on it. For now, I'm Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor, wishing you sweet, unobstructive dreams.